Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to our Light of Kailash lecture series organized by Shangshung Institute UK. Uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight for our talk about the biographies and autobiographies uh, on Adzun Drukpa, great master. And uh, we're very happy to welcome Learn Foot, who's a final year or better, actually final month away from defending his thesis exactly on the uh, biographies and autobiographies on Adzundrukpa. So we're very happy to welcome you tonight. And I won't say much more. At the end of the talk, we'll have some questions. So if you want to jot down your questions in the chat or just keep them for the end, um, then Learned will be taking some questions. So thank you everybody for joining us and thank you very much, Learn, and welcome. Uh Thank you so much, um, Jam Young, and hopefully you could hear me all right. If at any point the audio is strange, uh, let me let me know. Um, and uh, I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, so I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you so much for uh, giving me the chance to talk about my research on the life writings of Adam Drukpa. Um, I am especially grateful uh, to be here hosted by the Shangshung Institute uh, because it was founded by Professor Chogil Namke Norbu, uh, who himself is recognized as a reincarnation of Adzam Drukpa. Uh, so it's very uh, special to be able to talk about my, my research uh, in this, this context. So thank you so much for uh, inviting me to, to do so. Um, and I uh, let me start with the clicking. Uh, so just to say, again, Namke Norbu uh, was recognized as a reincarnation of Vadzum Drukpa, uh, and that is the reason that, for example, you see statues of Vadzum Drukpa in Italy uh, associated with his work. Uh, and also in various books published under the auspices of Namke Norbu come a lot of really wonderful details about Vadzum Drukpa's life and the life of his contemporaries. Uh, so it's a, these his scholarship has really been incredible in investigating this person's um this person's life. Um, and I wanted to also say just a little bit more thanks and also information about how it is that I got into studying this uh, this writing in particular. Um, and uh, uh, sort of the name uh, at the center here is my advisor, Ann C. Klein, uh, who is a professor at Rice, uh, who I've been working on my dissertation with. Uh, and I really, she is the reason that I started doing Tibetan studies in the first place. Uh, it's it's uh, been through her, uh, and it was through her connections to Adzam Drukpa's lineages as they are practiced today that I first became interested in this this life writing. Um, so Dr. Klein has been a huge um, uh, a huge uh, aid to me, and I'm so grateful for her. Uh, and she she invited numerous people to come and talk about the text at Rice, who I also want to say thank you to. Um, one of them was Adzum Gelsey Rinpoche, who is recognized as the reincarnation of Jirme Dorje, who is Adzum Drukpa's son. Uh, so he teaches now in Bhutan and Nepal. Uh, he spoke at Don Mountain for five different sessions, uh, probably about an hour and a half, two hours each, talking about these texts uh, and just gave such incredible information. And I'm really grateful to him for uh, helping me understand things that were not clear. Um, I want to thank Lama Sample Tenzin, who's a colleague of Dr. Klein's. Uh, he came to Rice to again speak about these texts over the course of a weekend before I ever read them. Um, and that again was a huge help. Uh, and then lastly, and probably the person who may have been the most helpful in this whole process is Ani Chupin Wangmo. And she is a nun who teaches at Rangjing Yeshe Institute in Nepal. And we basically, over the course of about uh, 18 months, we read through both of these uh, texts, which are quite long, uh, several times a week meeting on Zoom. Uh, and we just went page by page talking about the lines and the meaning and what they meant and what wasn't clear. Uh, so it really would have been totally impossible to do this research without Ani Chupin Wangmo um, and the other people here. So I want to say thank you to them. Um, and also to emphasize um, how much uh, this academic understanding comes from uh, connections to these uh, uh, communities and people who are carrying these on today. Um, so if I, I want to emphasize if I make mistakes or translation, that is due to a fault of my own and uh, anything that's um, insightful here is coming through the insights of, uh, of these people. Um, 
Okay, so we are talking about the life writings or the namtar of, of Adzam Drukpa, and there's a few different sources we have to understand his life. And uh, I've broken these out into Tibetan sources, and then also a number of sources in English that were either uh, translated into English after being written in Tibetan, uh, or just were written in English themselves. Uh, so looking at the Tibetan sources, we have two main texts. Uh, there's first of all, Adzam Drukpa's autobiography. Uh, and second of all, there's a biography of Adzam Drukpa that's written by his son, Gurme Dorje. Uh, and you can see images. There's a photograph of uh, Gurme Dorje here um, and a, uh, a portrait of Adzam Drukpa. Um, so I'll discuss more about the titles later, but just to give a brief overview, this autobiography, uh, so-called autobiography, it has the, um, the word namtar in it. Uh, it's 92 pages long. It's not technically an autobiography insofar as that while it's mostly in Adzan Drukpa's voice, it also describes his death and his funeral. So you can see that there's um, there's a sort of a committee effort uh, to produce the text in its final form. Uh, it may have first been published in 1926, a couple of years after Adzan Drukpa's death, uh, because it talks at the end about his um, his Sungbum collected works being published. So I think that this is when this autobiography was first uh, published. The edition I'm working off is a 2016 edition printed in uh, Chengdu. Uh, second of all, there's a biography written by uh, Guillermo Dorje. This one is almost two and a half times as long. Uh, it's 244 pages, so quite lengthy. Uh, and according to the Caliphon, uh, it was published in 1945. Um, so these are early 20th century Tibetan texts, uh, 1926, 1945. Um, there's also a number of English sources uh, that have information. And these are, first of all, uh, short biographies of Adzam Drukpa that are a couple of pages long, and then also examples where he shows up in other people's stories. Um, so to give an example of some of the short biographies that are available in English, um, uh, he appears in Nyoshul Kempu's uh, Omnibus, in uh, Leslie Bradburn's book, Tolkul Tundup's uh, The Treasury of Lives. Each of these cases, there's these uh, these short biographies, and I especially recommend The Treasury of Lives because it's available online. Um, one of the most interesting biographies of Adzam Drukpa was written by Sundrup Tso. Um, and so she was actually Namkai Norbu's grandmother. Uh, so she, uh, and she was also a disciple of Adzam Drukpa. So she is the only one of these short biographies to know Adzam Drukpa herself. Uh, and she wrote a biography of him that was uh, uh, contained within Namkai Norbu's book, Rainbow Body. Um, and this book also has a biography of her written by her granddaughter, which is very fascinating. Uh, you can also find her biography of Adzam Drukpa on Lotsawa House. Um, so those are some uh, great sources. And then he also shows up uh, all over the place uh, in other people's life writings. And this is, uh, you know, this is probably not an exhaustive list. If there's more examples people have, I would love to hear them. Uh, but these give an example of some of the uh, famous associates that Adzim Drupa had throughout his life. Um, one of the first prominent examples that I'll spend time more talking about is Gumpo Namgyal, who was a warlord who actually kidnapped Adzim Drukpa for several years. Uh, and you can see some of his really famous teachers, Pato Rinpoche, Jamgon Kongtrul. Um, he was uh, known as a consort of Sarah Kondro, uh, who was uh, covered by uh, Sarah Jacobi in her book, Love and Liberation. Uh, and there's many other examples, Dilgo Kiense, Jamian Kiense Choki Lodro, where within these biographies, we have these really rich, fascinating accounts of, of Adzam Drupa, uh, describing how he dressed, how he acted, um, uh, how he cried, how he laughed, uh, and these, these books have some wonderful, wonderful details. Um, so these are some of the sources that we have, and I also, I want to quickly locate us on the map, um, in case you are not familiar with the geography to give a sense of where it is, uh, this person's life that we're talking about. Uh, and I have two maps here, uh, the first one is kind of an overview of Tibet and the neighboring regions. And the areas that we'll discuss today uh, will include starting up here um, in the uh, Tsongun area, uh, traveling all the way down to Kham into the area where Adzum Drukpa lived. Uh, and he had students that came from all around this area. He had students that came from China, from Northern India, from Bhutan, from Nepal. Um, so really this whole, uh, from central Tibet, of course. Uh, so this whole uh, uh, area uh, is the um, milieu within, within which Adzam Drupa uh, lived. 
Uh, and you can see just a little bit more detail here. This is specifically Adzumgar, where his Dharma camp was located. Uh, you can see it's in the heart of Kham, uh, close to the Nyarong region. And uh, also you can see some of the monasteries that are come up again and again in the narrative, Zokjen, Katok, Pilyu, uh, the town of uh, the city of Derje. Um, these are all locations that uh, are rel regularly mentioned within the, um, within the autobiographies. Uh, and so also, as we'll talk about when we get to the political scene, the different forces that are active in this area uh, play an important role within these, um, these texts. Uh, so this is kind of a breakdown of different themes that I've uh, identified in thinking about these, uh, these texts. Um, and they are not independent. Oftentimes, the same passages show up in, in similar themes. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping to go through them today. Each one of these is actually a, a chapter in my dissertation. Uh, so I'm giving kind of a snapshot of the different kind of analyses uh, that are being done here. Uh, but to give a, a really high level overview, I'll talk about how do these texts function in terms of genre? Uh, what is the Namtar doing? How do these reflect the political and historical context of the times? I'll then go into looking at how do gender and sexuality operate in the texts. Uh, Adzum Drukpa was famous uh, in that he was not a celibate monk, but rather had uh, consorts. Uh, and this was advice to him both by uh, male human lama and also by a uh, divine woman who appeared to him uh, and advised him to take a consort. Uh, and I'll talk about some of that in the section on paranormal encounters. Uh, so this uh, latter section will really be focused on Adzum Drukpa taking up the career of a tertan or treasure revealer and what these texts say about that, that process. Uh, before, before we get into that, those details, uh, we'll first of all think about the text uh, as a whole and how they operate as life writings. Um, so both of them have the word Namtar in the title, um, and I've called one an autobiography and one a biography, uh, but really what they are is both Namtar, uh, this is translated often as complete liberation, indicating that often the purpose of these texts is to illustrate how somebody progressed on the path to liberation. Um, and especially in the past few centuries, writers have been very explicit about that goal. Uh, so you can see that, for example, here in Gurme Dorje explaining why did he choose to write this biography in the first place. And he says, as for the general purpose of biography, it is for the dependent relations relevant to the disciples of the compassionate that eventually arise if devotion is born even once from knowing the distinctive qualities of eminent beings. The particular purpose is for followers who hold biographies of the excellent as jewels of the heart and for clarifying hollow, suffocating doubts. Um, so the purpose of Namtar is partly to illustrate how a person goes along the path to liberation, but it's also meant to help the disciples of that person. Uh, so the liberation is pointing two ways, as people like Jane Willis have pointed out. Um, so what we see when we look at the biographies is two distinct views of Adzum Drupa, and one of them emphasizes his divine nature, um, his uh, equivalence with uh, deities such as George Chong, and another which emphasizes the auto uh, sorry, which emphasizes the, his humanity um, and sort of uh, uh, the human dimensions uh, of his his personhood. Um, and these are two distinct views that we see at work in these texts. Um, and uh, uh, just before we get there, I'll say a little bit about the um, uh, the book titles before I look at how these views develop. Um, so these are the full titles of uh, each of the two books. Jupang Jitsen Lame Namtar, Shalsung Majin Lap Tejin, and Jitsen Jupe Wangchuk, Rigsen Jodu Paul Jorje Namtar, Kiesang Yiki Dungsel. And you can see there's a lot of uh, overlap between these titles. I've highlighted the parts in red that are either uh, the same or just slightly reworked, as for example, Jup Wang, um, Jupe Wangchuk. Um, and this kind of the relation between these titles reflects the relationship between the text as a whole. Uh, so you can see that they're they're kind of covering different uh, uh, concepts. Uh, we have the notion that someone's words, uh, the way that they spoke, the shasuma will be will be shown. Uh, whereas down here we talk about the torture of mind. Um, so we have distinct uh, concepts, but at the same time they're both drawing on this notion of liberation. Uh, we also have different names. Uh, a personal name is used in the biography, uh, where he's he's cause called more just by the name Lama. Uh, within the autobiography. Um, and uh, uh, 
I think that the relationship between these titles where it has both similar words and also different words carries through throughout. Um, so I first of all want to look at how does the autobiography written in Azam Drupa's own voice uh, begin. So these are the first uh, lines of this autobiography. Um, and um, I'm not going to read the entire thing because I'll run out of time. Uh, but one thing that it really emphasizes is how he is paying homage to George Chong from the very beginning. He's uh, illustrating his devotion. He's saying, please help me along this path, grant your blessings. Uh, and he also emphasizes a lot of humility. He says how I'm not such a great person, uh, but nevertheless, my friends have asked me to write uh, my story. Uh, and I don't really remember it, but I'll go ahead and tell you anyways. Um, this is the kind of uh, tone with which he starts out. So you see a lot of devotion where he is the, you could say, student uh, supplicating to the master, Dorje Chong, um, and then also explaining in a humble way how he came to write his uh, biography. So this looks very different from what we see in the opening passages of the biography, um, which are right here. And the first difference you can see is that they're in verse. Uh, so it starts out with, uh, with an invocation, which right away gives a different feeling. Um, and it's a, it's a verse dedicated to Adzum Drukpa himself. And remember, Grume Dorje is the son of Adzum Drukpa, uh, and it describes him as uh, uh, Honorable Jume Longyang. And it mentions that he is the Lama who is actually Kunsang and Dorje Chong himself. Uh, so that means that Grume Dorje is placing his father, as he tells his story, on the level of the Buddhas from the very beginning, and again, emphasizing that we have this community of people that are gathered together uh, to hear this story. And so Girme Dorje implores people um, uh, to listen. Um, so it's really interesting from these two different texts how Dorje Chong shifts location. Uh, first of all, Adzum Drukpa is asking for his help in composing the autobiography. And then by the biography, Adzum Drukpa has become uh, George Chong himself. Um, so we see uh, two distinct views develop. Um, and the biography in many ways uh, expands upon the notion of who Azam Drukpa is from the very beginning. Uh, so Gurme Dorje includes all of these scriptural passages. Uh, he gives lists of Azam Drukpa's prior reincarnations that go way, way back to Yeshe Tsogil and Padmasambhava. Uh, in general, he gives a view of Azam Drukpa that is uh, relatively more deified. Um, so he emphasizes that uh, Azam Drupa is Kunsang, Samanta Bhadra, Vashodara, Dorje Chong. He says that Azam Drupa represents the compassion and the activity of the Buddhas, uh, and he establishes him as an emanation. Uh, but Jirme Dorje is still humble himself. So he says he doesn't have necessarily all of the power to describe this great being's qualities, but he's still going to do the best he can. Uh, and he emphasizes, uh, again, quoting scripture, that what we see as Adzum Drukpa is really just an emanation of a, of a higher power. Um, so that is the tone that Gurme Dorje takes from the beginning, which is very different from the more humble tone that Adzum Drukpa takes. Um, so both of them are humble in their own ways. Uh, Adzum Drukpa says, here's why I'm telling my story. Uh, Gurme Dorje says, I can't tell the whole thing, but I'll try. Uh, but at the same time, both of them are clearly telling the narrative and have a confidence insofar as how they do it. Um, and as I said, they both feature Dorje Chong in different ways. So here's an example of how these two different perspectives create a really fascinating um, dynamic. Um, so this is uh, very similar passages from the autobiography and the biography. Uh, and the, you can see them that they're very linked. I again put in purple the, uh, the common language. Um, so we have references to eight years old. Um, that is basically the same logie gungjangye. It's more honorific in the biography, but the meaning is the same. Uh, but the uh, despite the shared vocabulary, there's kind of a different emphasis that occurs, where Adzam Drupa emphasizes his difficulties learning to read, how he had this anxiety, and Jirme Dorje, in contrast, uh, takes that same language, uh, but emphasizes how this is an appearance that Adzam Drupa is uh, is giving, uh, as if he were ordinary, even though he is this um, this great being who's emanating. Um, and to me, what I find fascinating is that both of these perspectives are working together. Uh, and often these books are published as part of the same volume. Uh, so I don't see these as uh, necessarily one view being incomplete and then another. I think it's very fascinating that we have both of these perspectives showing up in the text. Um, and again, like the titles, like this example of learning to read, this uh, uh, fascinating play occurs between the two narratives uh, throughout the texts. 
Um, so that's a, a little bit about the distinct views of Adam Drupa. Um, I'm going to try to very, very quickly and not be very long, but spend a little bit of time talking about the scholarly reception of Tibetan biography and what I think that Adam Drupa's life writing tells us about um, uh, hagiography. Um, so first of all, the patterns that we see within these texts uh, have been studied before by scholars, and it's pretty common across lots of autobiographies for an autobiography to be very humble, uh, for a biography to be more elevated in its subject. Um, and there's been lots of uh, great analyses in recent years looking at these uh, kinds of rhetorical tropes, and we definitely see examples of that in the passages that I just saw. Um, I also think uh, Curtis Schaefer's point about biography is really fascinating because in the past few centuries, what was developing is this whole notion of what is biography, what is it supposed to do? Um, and we see uh, uh, authors uh, giving explanations of why the biography is written in such a way. And we saw that with Gurme Dorje. He says, here's why I wrote the biography of Adam Drupa. Uh, so in this context, as the Namtar get longer and longer and more elaborate, I think we can see the multidimensional perspective of Azam Drupa's life writing um, as fitting with into this larger literary uh, landscape. Um, and uh, some scholars, in my opinion, uh, see this in a way that uh, I don't necessarily agree with. So I'll, I'll just give some examples. Um, and this goes all the way back to the uh, first time that Europeans were reading these Tibetan Namtar. And a lot of times they had uh, very negative views. I'm going to be moving quickly here, but um, uh, Tucci is a classic example where he says that um, uh, reading an autobiography, you can't really tell what a person's personality is. Uh, he says that these events have nothing, these Namtar have nothing to do with politics or human events. Um, and that uh, uh, no spiritual strife ever transpires. We don't see a real person struggling with life. Instead, we just get this one-dimensional idealistic picture. Um, and there are elements of this that hold true, uh, but I think that uh, uh, Tucci's perspective is, uh, is missing he something here. Yet nevertheless, uh, that kind of a view has really persisted in scholarship. Um, so, for example, uh, Peter Schweiger is an example of someone who sees autobiographies as basically conforming to a template that's pre-established, where you don't really see any kind of individuality on the part of the individuals that are involved. Um, and then even when people do look at kind of the depth within autobiography, sometimes they say, okay, we have this autobiography that's really clear, and then the biography kind of becomes mythical and divinized and hagiographical. Um, so example of scholars who have taken this kind of approach um, is uh, Jane Gyatso when she's describing uh, Jigme Linkba's autobiography uh, and suggests that the autobiography is more authentic uh, than the biographical vision. Uh, a really good example of this kind of approach is taken in a, a recent 2020, uh, 2021 volume, uh, The Selfless Ego. Uh, and in the conclusion of their introduction, the editors say that Tibetan life writing devoids the biographical subjects of any intrinsic features that differ from the salvific or edifying project set by the biographical voice. Um, individuals become ideals. All we have is this hagiographic hey, matrix, uh, kind of stripping people of their individuality, their humanity. Um, and again, I think there's a lot that's true here and that we see these hagiographical hey, dimensions. But what I'd like to talk about today is the way that both of these texts, both the autobiography and the biography together, uh, really emphasize Adam Drukva's humanity and divinity uh, all the way through. Um, so some approaches that I think uh, are, are really helpful here um, uh, in establishing the way that Tibetan Namtar can have this multidimensional perspective um, is, uh, first of all, there's a great essay by uh, Lama Chop who talks about how uh, the modern critical tradition of Tibetan fiction is drawing on this, uh, this larger Tibetan literary tradition that precedes it. Um, Tupton Jimpa's biography of Tsongkhapa, where he talks about how he wants to show both a human and a Buddha at the same time. Um, and also Jan Willis's really amazing essays on uh, on Namtar, which are gathered in this uh, 2020 collection. And what, this, what these authors start to show is that we can have both perspectives at the same time uh, and the way that they, they can intersect. Um, so this is uh, to wrap up this kind of first section, uh, what I've talked about um, let me see. <laughs> uh, so I've emphasized how these life writings emphasize both humanity and divinity on the part of the uh, uh, central character, Adam Drukpa. Uh, some people see Namtar as flat or one-dimensional, uh, but I argue that 
uh, these life writings are putting the human side and the divine side uh, within this dynamic and creative tension. Um, and this uh, this kind of creative tension in autobiography is not just in Adam Drukpa, but you also see it in biographies about figures like Milarepa, uh, Tsongkhapa, uh, and even the, the Buddha's biographical writings. Um, so summing up with life writing, uh, what I'm trying to show is the way that these show both the human and the divine perspectives. Okay, so that is the first chunk. I'm going to take a, a quick second and have a, a small sip of kombucha and go to um, how do these uh, life writings deal with the uh, history and politics of the time? Um, so uh, these uh, life writings have a lot of emphasis on war, on the military. Uh, and that's not surprising given that this was a very turbulent period uh, in 19th and 20th century Eastern Tibet. Um, so in this section, I'm gathering together especially what are the accounts of uh, military um, conflicts that Adam Trukpa depicts. And then I'm also going to explore how do these military events impact the way that he thought about Rime uh, or non-sectarian uh, ideals. Um, so first of all, starting with uh, the beginning of both the autobiography and the biography, they explain where it is that Adzum Drukpa's uh, ancestors came from. Uh, and his ancestors are described as Sokpo, which is often translated as Mongolian, although that can be controversial. Uh, so he comes from Sokpo ancestors coming from the area uh, by Tsungun up here. Um, uh, and they travel in the 16th century all the way down to Kham, actually to Litang, um, which is right about here. Um, and so we know this is the 16th century because his ancestor describes how he met the third Dalai Lama, Sunim Gyatso, at this period, uh, and they had an auspicious encounter. Um, and then a little bit later, there in Litang, uh, the family then moves up to the Azumgar area, which is more in the Nyarung. Um, and both autobiography and biography start out in this way by describing how it is that his family came uh, to this area, how it is that they lived here. Uh, and there's one kind of fascinating uh, narrative that takes place uh, bridging the story of his ancestors and the, the his contemporary time um, when uh, Adzun Drukpa describes how he met Sake Jitsunma Tadim Wangmo, and she's described in this um, this biography by Elizabeth Bernard. And Sake Jitsunma sees the gift that the third Dalai Lama gave to Adzun Drupa and confuses him for a Geluk, uh, and he has to correct her and inform her that he is actually a Nyingma uh, Lama. Um, so that uh, that hints at some of the uh, uh, multi kinds of affiliations uh, that are happening within this context. Um, one of the first political events that Adzum Drukpa uh, describes is uh, he gives a detailed account of Gompo Namgyal and the Central Tibetan Army in 1865. Um, so Gompo Namgyal, as described in this excellent history by Yuju Tsumu, uh, took over a lot of the uh, the eastern of the Nyarong region of eastern Tibet. Um, and she describes in her book how Adzum Drukpa was among those young Lama and Tulku who were held captive uh, for, for a long period of time in order for Gompo Namgyal to uh, retain his rule. Um, and so the biographies describe this. They describe how he had to go there, how he had to perform these services, uh, and eventually how he uh, escaped in 1865. And his account is really interesting because not only does he describe the kind of the violence and brutality with which uh, Gampo Nemgil operated, he also gives a, a fairly harrowing depiction of the um, uh, the Depe Shungpe, uh, or the army of the central Tibetan um, government uh, coming into the region. And he describes how he had to flee across an ice bridge uh, and all the shouting and the, um, uh, the fear that he felt. Uh, so we have uh, a pretty complex approach that uh, depicts um, um, uh, kind of two different forces coming into uh, tension with each other. Uh, and this is described both in the autobiography and the biography. And it's interesting because it's in this context of uh, military turmoil that Adzum Drukpa first starts uh, uh, experiencing visions or encounters uh, with paranormal beings, uh, as we'll discuss later. Um, so a, a significant portion at the beginning of both of these texts is, is dedicated to his experience in this uh, this military conflict. Um, there's also an account of military conflict at the end of his life in 1917, 
Uh, and I'm actually looking for more uh, information about this. If anybody uh, has any recommendations, uh, these are two sources I found that describe um, how there were there was conflict between Central Tibet and uh, Chinese troops in these Kampa borderlands. Um, and Azam Drukpa's, um, uh, his camp was destroyed uh, during this time period. And this is near the end of his life when he was quite old, um, near the end of the autobiography and biography, uh, respectively. So we see both at the beginning and at the end, these, uh, these uh, uh, tempestuous military moments uh, that illustrate the uh, intensity of life during that period. Um, and I think it's I think you can look at his connections to the uh, so-called Rime movement within this context. Um, and just to give a, a little bit of of context here, uh, Eastern Tibet was a really fascinating period. Uh, and there's a, a lot of scholarship that's been done. Uh, this volume in particular looked at the ways in which um, uh, the non-sectarian ideals, the impartial ideals, also had these political connections uh, that worked in in complex ways. Um, so kind of like one classic rendition of it is that uh, some people who ascribe to Rime, uh, they'd be Sakya or Nyingma um, or Kagyu, and they would have an anti geluk perspective and say, uh, we have the Geluk who are running things in central Tibet and uh, uh, that government, and we want to have uh, a way of uh, maintaining our traditions outside of that, whereas others uh, developed a more uh, nuanced approach that appreciated the Geluk. Um, and as these scholars uh, illustrate, uh, this also connects to the uh, efforts that the 13th Dalai Lama was making during that time period um, to have a, a, a stable government. Um, so among this uh, really complex political landscape, it's interesting to see where does Azam Drupa uh, position himself. Um, so just for example, uh, some of his teachers, such as Jamgon Kongtrul and uh, Pema Dudul, uh, supported um, Gompo Namgyal, Whereas Anzam Drupa, in contrast, gives a very uh, more negative depiction, probably because he had been held hostage and members of his family uh, had been killed. Um, he also doesn't have an attitude against the Geluk like some people such as Jamgun Kongtrul does. Uh, so he describes in his autobiographies how some people told him negative things about the Geluk, uh, but he says that he really regretted encountering these wrong views, uh, and he eventually learned to appreciate Tsongkhapa and see his brilliance. Uh, and the person that it mentions in this context is Mipam Rinpoche, uh, which is interesting because he also developed a very nuanced uh, approach to uh, Tsongkhapa, as Douglas uh, Duckworth describes. Um, and so we can see that uh, we could, Azam Drukpa could be seen as uh, within the various positions of what Rime could represent to people. He represents uh, what Duckworth calls a kind of hybridity uh, between Nyingma and Geluka relations. Um, but when he does this, he's very explicit uh, not to uh, let the other traditions get lost. Um, so, for example, in the autobiography, he describes uh, having pure perception impartial to all insiders, meaning Buddhists and Bun. Uh, so we see a, a favorable mention of Bun. Um, and then a, a similar passage on uh, in the biography that uses this language of Rime to describe how he has an attitude that embraces all traditions, uh, not just Buddhist, but also, also Bun. Um, so I'm sort of inclined to read these uh, his experiences with war that so much shaped his life in connection to these, uh, these non-sectarian ideals. Um, and uh, uh, I forgot to mention also, I should have said that um, what, uh, one of the ways that we see politics operating in these texts is in the connection that he had to various local rulers. Uh, some were negative, like Gompo Namgyal, uh, whereas others were patrons and supporters. Um, and so kind of throughout these autobiographies, we have a, a very nuanced depiction of the political landscape of the period. Uh, and I think that um, uh, and my uh, my argument is that uh, his life narratives are reflecting the war trauma that he endured as a young man and at the end of his life. And that his particular iteration of Rime, uh, which is focused on Nyingma, it's pro-Bun, pro-Geluk, uh, but also critical of the military attitudes or actions of the Geluk at times, uh, I think that this attitude reflects his experience uh, within this uh, social and political landscape. Um, so that's to give kind of a high-level overview of the way that politics uh, and um, and so forth fit into this uh, these life stories. Um, from here, I want to move into talking about gender and sexuality and uh, his decision to take up uh, consort practice. And um, uh, gender and sexuality, 
paranormal, all of these are words that don't appear in the text. Uh, so they require a, a bit of analysis to think about. Um, and in terms of this, I'm, I'm breaking out into two different categories here. One is to think about uh, who were the women that are mentioned in Azam Drukba's life writing? And then secondly, how does his consort practices fit into his life story? Um, so we've already seen a lot of examples of uh, women from different uh, uh, texts uh, that I've already mentioned uh, that show up within his life stories. Sakya Jitsunma, um, Flundrup Tso, who wrote his biography. Um, Daechin Chuki uh, Wangmo is an interesting example because she was a Bun uh, treasure revealer uh, who also wrote autobiographies and biographies herself, uh, Sarah Kondro. Uh, so these are ones we've already talked about who have already been discussed in academic scholarship, uh, but there's others who are mentioned within his life writings who I have not found reference to in, uh, in scholarship uh, who also have very interesting stories. Um, and so these are just some examples of uh, uh, some of the uh, kinds of figures that appear. Uh, often women appear in among the list of patrons. Uh, they're often listed in connection to, uh, to elite ruling families. Uh, so we have kings or rulers and daughters. Um, there's an example given of Sonam Sumo, uh, and she is um, a lady of the ruler of Derge, and she uh, is, is praised for uh, raising donations to help Adam Drupa's health, and he attributes his long life uh, uh, to her and good health. Um, so she's kind of a powerful, politically connected patron. Uh, there's also this interesting example of all of this, uh, these different women's names, seven total women that are listed in the biography as being among his disciples. Um, and I don't know who a lot of these women are. One of them has the same name as one of his consorts. Uh, so it's possible that this is her, um, uh, Tashi Hlamo. Uh, but this is a really interesting list because it makes you wonder who were these uh, women that gathered uh, to be uh, students of, of Adzum Drupa. And sadly, there's not uh, more information about them, but we have these interesting references. Um, one of the narratives in the autobiography that goes into a lot of detail about a woman practitioner is the story of Sonam Wangmo. Um, and this appears uh, in the autobiography um, near the end, Adam Drukpa is relatively uh, old at this time, uh, and he meets uh, Sonam Wangmo at the time she's 20 years old. Uh, she's from the Chakla region. She's a, a queen. Um, and uh, what really comes across in this narrative is what an incredible student that she is. Um, so Adzum, and I'm not going to, uh, it's sort of beyond the scope of this presentation to talk about all the practices that she's she's doing here. Um, but it starts out with uh, with Ngundro, with uh, preliminary practices, but really quickly gets into uh, uh, advanced Dzogchen practices. Um, and uh, Adzum Drupa specifically clarifies how, how much aptitude she has, how bright she is, uh, that it's not necessary for him to point out the nature of mind to her. She understands uh, anyway. Um, and uh, so she has these uh, these tremendous realizations uh, in Dzogchen practice. Uh, she ends up becoming a nun. Uh, and this is an interesting example because scholars have sometimes uh, uh, thought that Tibetan um, life writing doesn't focus on the practice of women. Uh, and this is a really fascinating example of a, uh, a woman uh, really excelling. And there's no other example I can think of in the autobiography that goes into so much detail about a practitioner and her progress along the path uh, and that praises her in this way. Um, so I think this is a really, it's a, it's a fascinating account. And also the way it describes her having renunciation and world weariness, um, those qualities are only ever mentioned in relation to Adzum Drukpa. So this narrative is also establishing a connection between this queen um, or this princess um, uh, and between Adzum Drukpa that, uh, that is quite fascinating. I haven't found out more about her life uh, and I would really uh, like to do so. Um, but for now, I just have that uh, interesting narrative. Um, so to give a, a little bit of a conclusion, although this topic will continue into the next, um, we can see that there is a limited but significant presence of women in Azam Drukpa's milieu. So it's not as if there aren't more um, uh, male lama, for example, being mentioned, and this is a critique that's made of uh, Tibetan life writing. Uh, but there are these really significant examples of, of women, including many who were themselves authors of life writing, uh, such as Hun Jup Tso, Dechen Chuki Wangmo, Sarah Kondro. Um, and then there's also uh, women who are not discussed in recent scholarship. Uh, so women's life writing during this period uh, is a vital ground of further research. Oh, I forgot a whole section here. Um, 
Okay, so before we get to this conclusion, one of the huge themes within these life writing is consort practices. Um, and how in the in terms of Jamian Kensei Wangpo, uh, Adam Drukpa's uh, teacher, he says to Adam Drukpa, from now on, you need to let your hair get matted and rely on a woman helper. Um, so this becomes a really important journey for Adam Drukpa to make in terms of thinking, how do I take on uh, these consort practices? Um, and this was a kind of a controversial uh, uh, thing at the time. Um, and within uh, some of uh, uh, Adam's contemporaries, such as Mipam Rinpoche, uh, the Third Dondrupchen, et cetera, uh, they would talk about how treasure of revelation could kind of be associated with uh, with women in a way that for some people was was kind of frightening. Um, and this applied both to uh, to women and to men, where there would be disapprobation and thinking that treasure revelation involved uh, sexuality in a way that was somehow inappropriate. Um, and I think that these kinds of uh, controversies are part of the reason that Adzum Drukpa displays a lot of reluctance uh, when he is confronted with the advice of his teachers. Uh, so, for example, Pema Dudul, uh, at one point they're having a conversation, and uh, Pema Dudul, like Jamyang Kensei Wangpo, says, let your hair get matted, uh, but Adzum Drukpa is very reluctant. He says, no, family life is cyclic existence, uh, and Pema Dudul insists you must let your hair get matted and depend on the body of another. Uh, so we see these gurus uh, giving this advice for him to take on uh, these consorts, even though that could have controversial dimensions. Um, so that was this part of the conclusion, and that the treasure revelation career that Adam Dripa takes on involved these complex, diverse perspectives on sexuality, often linked rhetorically to gender and to femininity. Um, and a big part of these life writings is explaining how did Adam Drupa take that on? Um, and that is fully laid out and described in the secret life writing, or the Sangwe Namtar, the secret autobiography, uh, the accounts of Azam Drukpa's encounters um, with Yeshe Tsogyal, um, or with uh, women who uh, seem to be Yeshe Tsogyal, even if they don't identify themselves uh, that way. So moving on into the, the last section here, uh, uh, which I've called paranormal encounters here. Um, and I'm thinking here of a, a, a there's encounters with ghosts, with uh, gods and demons, uh, with awakened deities, all kinds of examples. And just to quickly go through a couple of them, um, the first time that you see Adzan Drupa kind of having one of these uh, uh, experiences in the biography is when he's still uh, captive in Yarong. Uh, he's held hostage and he sees a, a book of treasure, of terror, and he thinks it's not very good. Uh, but then in the uh, the middle of the night, there's a snake that comes out of the book and rises up to the sky, uh, shooting fire. And so Adam Drupa realizes, oh, this must be a really good uh, tear. Um, and so uh, Adam Gelsi Rinpoche, in a recent Zoom talk, thought that this encounter really marked the beginning of his, uh, his career uh, as a treasure revealer. Um, Within the biography, the autobiography, that story isn't told. It's left out entirely. And the first time you see Adam Drukpa kind of having one of these encounters is when he meets um, what I'm calling a lady of the skies. And this is on pages 13 and 14 of the autobiography. Uh, and he has this um, uh, this incredible conversation with, um, uh, with a woman, um, a bume, who appears. Um, and I'll just, I'll read it quickly. It says... Um, Day and night by myself without leisure, I made a thousand complete long and short feast offerings. After midnight on the 15th, exhausted, I slept a little. In a state where experience and dream were not separate, there was a lady in the sky without support, wearing outstanding ornaments and clothes, sitting like a blacksmith. She explained to very many of my own prior births and incarnation lines, but I caught none of the meaning of her words except for hazy whispers. Who are you? I asked. Don't you know me? She said. I am Ting Barma, the girl of Ngayap Ling. As before, I understood nothing of the meaning of her words. Now, did you understand that? She asked. I don't understand anything, La, I said. Again, she spoke. In the future, you need to powerfully reveal many treasure caches. So she's telling him that he's going to be a treasure revealer. Um, so this is kind of the first uh, encounter with what you could say is a, a deity um, within the autobiography. Uh, and she goes on to urge Adzim Drukpa, telling him to take a consort. I'd uh, even mention a specific woman that would be appropriate, what her parents' names are. Um, and so she, Ting Barma, this woman who appears in the sky, is actually the first one to tell Adzim Drukpa to do this. Uh, but it seems like he doesn't listen. 
Uh, as a few pages later, that's when Pema Doodle, as we saw earlier, tells him to let his hair get matted. Uh, Adam Drupa's students start to lose faith in him. He has all these dreams and visions of uh, feminine entities that are appearing, uh, sometimes uh, frightening. Uh, Pema Doodle proceeds to carry on a ritual uh, in which Adam Drupa is left stiff and people carry him around by his, uh, his armpits. Uh, and he has all of these even more terrifying dreams before Jamian Kensei finally shows up and says, uh, you need to find a consort. So these uh, these uh, visionary dimensions are woven throughout the advice of his teachers telling him about what he um, he has to do. Um, so the biography account of this woman or lady of the skies is uh, even more interesting uh, because she is uh, specifically identified, and it's a little bit hard to see here, um, but she's identified as Yeshe Tsukyo. And within the autobiography, uh, that narrative kind of comes at the very beginning when he's escaping, whereas in the biography, this whole conversation occurs in its own section about seeing the face of the Queen of Space, uh, Yeshe Tsugyo, or the yogic discipline for showing the face of Yeshe Tsugyo. Um, and then uh, as he's uh, he's uh, encountering this, this woman in the sky, the biography gives additional details that say that Adam Drukpa was having conviction that this was Yeshe Tsugyo. He thinks this certainly must be her. Um, and so unlike the autobiography, this biography is very explicit about uh, that this is not just, um, you know, a, a, a random uh, 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 goddess appearing in the sky, but Yeshe Sogil uh, herself. Um, and yet, uh, even still, Adam Drupa is in the biography is not, he's unsure, he's uncertain about himself, uh, and he ends up not going to find that consort. It says, um, he has this uh, this doubt where he says, uh, in general, there is no point to going to that long distant place merely for the sake of a woman. In particular, what if that prophecy is the deceptive bait of a demon? Such conceptual thoughts of not searching arose in his mind and the auspicious connection disappeared. And because he doesn't take her advice, even more dreams come, same as in the autobiography, again, these same horrifying dreams, uh, until he finally listens. Um, and so these two accounts of the Lady of the Skies, they both give very fascinating uh, portrayals of, of, of Yeshe Tsukyo, one in which she's implied to be, certainly implied to be a Dakini and that she appears in the sky, uh, and in the biography, explicit, and yet still raising these fascinating doubts and, uh, doubts and questions. Uh, so I'm definitely, I'm not going to read all of this, um, but this is kind of what I meant at the beginning when I said that these are not flat portraits of kind of an idealized figure, because within this life story, you have kind of the very conflicted, intense, uh, and self-questioning account of how he took on consort practices, how he was advised to um, by uh, visionary uh, ladies that he's meeting. Um, and I think that I've, I said, I've said most of this already, uh, but what I find really fascinating is that this is not just, uh, you know, she shows up and everything is wonderful and it's perfect, but instead you see these uh, these accounts of doubt, fear, and questioning that show up not just in the autobiography, but also in the biography, and even amplified, because the biography is more explicit about the fear that what if this is a demon or a delusion or in some way inauthentic. Um, so we see within both of these texts a very uh, human um uh, dimension that is existing alongside these. Uh, one of the the best um, uh, 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 articles about this is Dominique Townsend's Feeling the Way to Revelation, Patterns of Doubt and Persuasion, uh, that talk about how this is really common in Tibetan Buddhist uh, life writing, uh, to have these, these rich encounters of encounters with awakened deities, but also having these uh, the humane feelings of uh, doubt and fear that accompany them. Um, and uh, it's interesting. Um, so uh, scholars like uh, Rob Mayer, for example, have looked at Treasure Revelation uh, more recently as connected to these larger cross-cultural practices. Uh, you could look at sort of similar phenomena existing uh, in Italy um, or um, uh, in Mormons, for example. And uh, there's a few scholars of comparative religion that ask, is this something about human experience uh, where we have uh, these kinds of encounters, uh, these revelatory events? Uh, and these are three books uh, that I've read in grad school that are not about Tibetan Buddhism per se, but I think they also have similar feelings that we see in Tibetan literature of the doubt, the questions, and the intense experiences uh, that that show up uh, in these kinds of um, uh, stories. Um, so these are three very interesting books that uh, maybe help us think about treasure revelation in a uh, cross-cultural uh, context. 
Okay, so that that is uh, pretty much the end. Um, just to quickly wrap up the different things that uh, that I've been saying and talking about to remind uh, uh, you and myself of of what I've said. Um, I really think that these kinds of life writings are not just giving a one dimensional idealized flat portrait of uh, a person, but they're creating a multi-dimensional perspective that is even critical and that it's investigating what is the motives uh, of the of the person that's involved. Um, Within this life writing, you also see uh, the 19th century and 20th century trend of increased militarization. And I think that uh, Adam Drukba's uh, appeals to uh, impartial non-sectarian Rime ideals uh, are a reflection of this uh, social and political landscape. Um, it's uh, uh, Scholars have uh, often emphasized the way that uh, women do not appear so much in some examples of Tibetan life writing. And um, I think that Adam Drupa's uh, life writings give uh, interesting uh, complexity to that idea because you do see this uh, very significant presence of women. And you also see within Adam Drupa's taking down the career of a treasure revealer, the ways that uh, uh, concepts of gender and sexuality become very important and establish these connections to femininity for him, uh, which are most visible in his encounters with the Lady of the Skies, uh, who calls herself Ting Barma. Uh, and who in the biography is called Yeshe Tsogil herself. Um, and again, what I think is really fascinating about these kinds of encounters uh, is that they give a very multidimensional point of view where we see this one person, uh, both from the perspective of someone who's struggling and wondering what is going on, how do I make it through the day? And then also from the point of view of someone who says that everything is, is all right and kind of a reflection of this uh, luminous wisdom and that both of these things are uh, existing at the same time in the same sentences within the same narratives and yet as distinct points of view uh, within these, um, these narratives. Okay, I feel like I've, I've spoken for uh, a long time, too long, so I'm going to stop now. Um, I apologize, I was hoping that that would take more like 40 minutes, but it seems to have taken a little bit longer. And can I stop sharing, perhaps? Thank you so much, Learned, and uh, congratulations on your very interactive screen. I've never seen such a, a technological presentation, screen sharing, very nice. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so question-wise, if we have any questions, I see we have many great names in Tibetan studies here, so I'm sure we have lots of interesting questions coming tonight. And um, yeah, thank you. Really interesting and very comprehensive view, really. Do we have any questions? If anybody wants to just unmute themselves and ask, you're welcome to uh, jump in. Nobody yet. I have a question for you, Lern. I saw some of these original sources you were mentioning in the beginning, and I, I remember seeing an incredible variety of names, for example, uh, birth name, name given by the Lama who recognized them as a reincarnation, name he takes when he's given initiation by another Lama. I mean, just such an array. It, it must be quite difficult to navigate these namtas, I imagine, for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, there are multiple names, and Lama Tenzin actually said you should go through and uh, collate all the times they appear and when they do, but I, I haven't done that yet. Um, and I, I just for an example, the name Drodo Powell Dorje, and I have to go back and confirm this because I, I'm getting this off the top of my head, but that name I think was given to him by Yeshe Tsogil, if I'm not mistaken. So even the particular names that are used uh, in particular context mean certain things. Um, so different names are given to him at different times. And this makes it very confusing when I look for evidence of him in other people's Namtar, because you never know what name he'll show up as. Uh, so it could be Drodo Paolo Dorje, it could be Adam Drukpa, um, and there's there's a few others as well. Um, so definitely the multi-naming uh, can be a, a challenge. And then not only that, but he's talking about hundreds of people within his life writings, hundreds. Um, and they're also referred to by different names uh, throughout. So it's you kind of you see uh, some of the really famous people like Jam Gong Control, Jam Yang Kenze Wangpo. It's it's easy to get the hang of it, but often there'll just be a string of names, and it's really kind of an intriguing challenge to figure out who were all these all these people. 
indeed not easy not easy do we have any other questions please don't be shy i see lots of uh, hi, highly intelligent I, people i, I couldn't uh, work out how to for some reason i couldn't raise the hands but anyway oh. uh, I, I mean it's, it's it's great material i look forward to seeing it uh, and it's a pity rob couldn't be here today i, I mean i spoke to him earlier and he was he couldn't and also unfortunately this session almost uh clashes with the um uh graduate seminar in oxford so lama jab and all rika and so on i'm sure they would have liked to have been here too so <laughs> it's uh it's, it's unfortunate but anyway i mean you know great material look really look forward to it but yeah so um one thing i was wondering i mean is the whole thing of how he if at all, if he connects up with his, you know, previous incarnations in what he writes, because this is one of the things that I noticed a lot from Dujum Limpers and Doodle Dorje's um, life writing kind of thing, you know, that they're really sort of um, connecting with, you know, a sort of sense of self, which wasn't limited just to this one incarnation especially of course for Teotons you know they're going to be you know a particular uh student of Guru Rinpoche's who is coming up so I just wonder how the material deals with this if at all and whether there's a difference between you know what you're calling the autobiography and what you're calling the biography uh, absolutely. Thank you. And just to say quickly that the lecture series happening on Treasure right now has been so awesome. And I love also that it's it's recorded, which I think this is too, to, to go back and watch them, because I really love kind of looking at Terma, not just in a Tibetan Buddhist context, but thinking about these other examples. So I think it's a very interesting line of uh, uh, thought. Um, so for the reincarnations, there are different uh, attitudes in the autobiography and the biography. Um, so the autobiography makes a little bit of reference to his immediate incarnations, and this, according to Adzum Gilser Mucci, are people in his direct family. Um, so it's just, uh, it's be, you know, uh, the previous incarnation was Riggs and Chempo, and uh, he reincarnated within the same family, and there's some stories about them, but it's very local, very specific. Uh, Jeremy Dorje, on the other hand, gives this like vast, elaborate, like pantheon of all of these people that Azim Rupa was. And it goes, it goes to India, it goes to Tibet. Here's the great masters of India, the great masters of Tibet. He's um he's Yeshit Sokil, he's Guru Rinpoche, he's Tri Sung Ditsen, he's he's all of them at the same time. Um, and it's kind of this this really beautifully elaborate uh, uh depiction of all the people that Jeremy Dorje uh sees his father as being. Um but again, they're very interesting because the autobiography makes these little references. And even when Yeshe Tso, or Ting Barma is speaking to him, uh, he says, oh, she told me about my prior incarnations, but I didn't really catch it. And then clearly by the time we get to Girmay Dorje, we have a really strong sense of who all those people were. Um, and the way uh, I imagine it is that, you know, they must have a very close relationship as father and son. Uh, so some of the things that Asan Drukpa couldn't put into his own autobiography uh, then get picked up. By someone who probably had been hearing these kinds of stories all of his life and becomes this vision of Ajahn Drupa as connected to all of these these beings. Um, but in terms of prior reincarnations, the main connection is to Yeshe Tsukyo, um, as I said, and there's also a lot of connection to Jigme Lingpa and Long Chempa, um, but I don't think, well, he might actually be identified as a reincarnation of them. I have to check that, that full passage again. Um, but that would be the other examples of people that he has a very close and also visionary relationship with. I notice it's getting a little bit dark in my room. I think the the sun has gone behind a cloud. You mentioned uh... Adzam Rinpoche in Shechen Monastery. And uh, some time ago I met him and he told me the story of when he was born in Bhutan. I don't know if you're familiar with the story. And 
Um, I think I forget he was born in 1981, something like that. So it was quite a few years after the death of Jume Dorje. And then when he was born, there was a prophecy and they brought, uh, his older brother was brought to Dilgo Kienze in Kaman, no, in, um, in Gelepu, I think in Bhutan at the time. And the Gogans immediately said, no, it's not, this is not the reincarnation. The boy is born and I forget the monkey or a different astrological year. So there was a sort of whole, um, I wouldn't say confusion because the Gogans was very clear about uh, who it was, but there was some kind of initial confusion, we could say, about the reincarnation of uh, Jorma Dorje. I don't know what uh, if there were other potential candidates. I mean, this is a bit off topic. It's about the son of Adzom Jokpo, but I'm just curious about it, If since you're well versed in this. I I actually, I haven't heard that story from, from Adzom Gyalse Rinpoche. Um, and I also haven't encountered that much about the life of Gyalse Dorje, except for the short biographies in, for example, Nyoshil Kempo. And he has a collected works himself that has a set of biographies in it, and I really would like to read those. I just I haven't done so yet, um, and I want I don't think that would tell us about Adam Gelsi Rinpoche and kind of the the connection between um, the prior incarnation, uh, but that is a uh, a future thing to look into that person's life, um, and a similar thing is also true for Adam Drukpa. So you had multiple incarnations of him. I mentioned Namkai Norbu at the very beginning, uh, but you also had Drukto Rinpoche who lived at Adzumgar for, for I think, his whole life. Um, so even in the case of Adzum Drukpa, there were multiple people that were then incarnated and carrying on um, his activities. Um, and the same, for example, like Jamyang Kensei Wangpo, like Adzum Drukpa, there's an anecdote where he meets uh, Jamyang Kensei Chuki Lodro, and he says, oh, there's all these other incarnations, and you know, I don't know about them, but like when I met you, I really... I cried and I felt devotion and I was, it made me, it made me sad. Um, so you, you, you have the sense, you know, that there could be multiple incarnations of a person and people might form connections in different ways to those different incarnations. Yeah, indeed. There's a nice saying I saw in Anamta somewhere. It's like these great masters, they're like uh, the moonlight, which reflects in lots of different bodies of water because they're so magnificent they take forms it was a very poetic way of describing it anyway mm -hmm. do we have any more questions from anybody or learn would you like to add anything else in particular uh i don't think so i'm so grateful to everybody for for coming and listening today um and i i think probably i talked a little bit fast but i did get through kind of the what i was hoping to uh, to give a flavor for, and it really is just a small flavor of how rich these texts are. Um, so I'm very um, happy to be able to, to yeah. do so with you. Just a quick question. Um, is uh, Yese Silvano Nobushi-san reincarnation of uh, Adjung Trumpa? Is he recognized as a reincarnation? Is is who, sorry? Uh, Yese Silvano Nobushi-san. Namkai Nobushis. Namkai oh. Jokshin community Namkai Nobus. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure about that actually. And I've I've only seen the documentary. Um there's a documentary, I think it's on Amazon or Netflix about Namkai Norbu and it interviews his son at some length. But I'm not sure if his son is considered a uh an incarnation of, of Atam Drukpa's son in the way that Namkai Norbu is a recognized as an incarnation of Atam Drukpa. And that's interesting. I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Learn. Okay. Thank Thanks you so much. much. Cool. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody. And uh, thank you, Jamyang, for, uh, for inviting thank me. Thank you. Thank you for your great research.